that the Lord has. A lot of people, yeah, yeah, brother, he does need advertising. Yeah, a lot of people don't think he needs advertising, so they sit around with their fingers in their ear, not doing what they're supposed to do and not showing Jesus to a dying world. But the world does need to know that the Lord's around and we're the best advertising that he's got. A lot of people think that uh, the job of evangelism, the job of evangelizing the world is going to be done by the TV preachers. Some people think that it's going to be done by the people who make the records. Other people think that it's going to be done by the people who do these kind of concerts. But I got news for you. The best evidence that Jesus is alive in your neighborhood is you. I want to do a little experiment here tonight. How many of you tonight that are here are Christians? Just say amen. <laughs> it was a shock to me some years ago to be confronted with the fact that all of a sudden I'm talking to the church, me, Mike Warnke. I, I, you know, I never thought I was called to talk to the church. I thought God just called me because he had a lot of weird people he wanted to get to, you know. When we first started in a ministry, I was working in a coffee house, you know. I, I uh, got called by the Lord to go into this coffee house ministry, and we were reaching a lot of street people for the Lord. And I can remember how I got called. The Lord really didn't put the call on me first. He, he called somebody else. But because of some of, this, the, some of the problems that this man had with this calling, he got me and some other people like me to help him, you know. We were in this church, and this was in the days before it was cool to have a big testimony. I mean, there for a while, you know, it got to be there for a while. If you didn't have a testimony, nobody let you talk about Jesus, you know. I mean, you know, if you got up in church and you said, Hey, my testimony is, I got saved when I was five years old, and I'm 37 now, and I've been serving the Lord for 32 years, and it's really wonderful. Everybody go, blah, 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 you know. You get some guy come in here and say, Yesterday I killed my mother, but last night I got saved. And they say, Oh, tell us about Jesus, brother, you know. You know. And it's like, like the gruesomer the testimony, the more action you got. That's how I got into comedy in the first place. I have a pretty gruesome testimony. And when I first got saved, everybody wanted to hear my testimony. Well, not when I first got saved, but when I first got into the ministry, everybody wanted to hear my testimony. I got so tired of talking about the devil, and I saw people getting so tired of me talking about the devil, I started throwing a few jokes in just to lighten my testimony up, and lo and behold, everybody, everybody got more blessed by the jokes than they did by the testimony, and all of a sudden, I'm a Christian comedian. In the beginning, though, I was in this church, and I was laying low because this was in the days before having a gruesome testimony was an in thing to do. And I was kind of laying low, and I used to go to church every Sunday and sit next to this lady. She's about 78 years old, and she had her hair, you know, in one of them buns, you know, big gray hair deal. And she did, did it so tight that her face was, you know, kind of, ugh, like that, you know. And, and she used to sit next to me, and she had no idea what my testimony was. I, I often kind of fantasized about looking at her and saying, you know, I used to be a Satanist and eat flesh and drink blood. Why she go, ah, you know, just... Pass out right there, you know. So, because like, she's one of those ladies whose big sin was like she ate too many cookies. Uh, and uh, so, you know, uh, of course, people got a concept that there are good sins and bad sins, and that people come up to me all the time and say, you know, brother, I was bad, but I wasn't as cruddy as you. <laughs> And I say, yes, I was pretty bad, and I was going to the same hell as you, you know. Uh, you know? thing about it is, at least I knew I was going to hell. There's a whole lot of people out here think they're cool and they ain't going to go to hell and just think how much more horrible it is when they get down there and they're surprised, you know. <laughs> oh, I didn't even believe in this place, you know. And the uh, devil said, right, get in that line over there, you know. Anyway. <laughs> you know. So anyway, the preacher in our church, he knew about our testimonies, but most of the people in the church didn't. 
at least keeping it kind of learning the word and growing and everything like that, and just kind of keeping a low profile. There's about six of us in the church been ex heroin addicts and you know street people and stuff, but we was just you know we dressed and had our little haircuts and you know just kind of blended in with everybody else. And uh, one day, the Holy Spirit descends on the preacher and gives him a burden to reach hippies. Now, this is really weird, see, because he didn't come out and get us to come to his church. We just kind of wandered in there from separate directions. We thought we just did it, you know, oh, let's see, where shall we go to church? Flip a coin, playing, you know, and we went. But actually, the Holy Spirit was leading us the whole time because he had this whole thing all rigged before we got into it. We didn't know that, see. <laughs> Holy Spirit's good about that. He's got this whole plan. He's got it all mapped out. And you think you're going along on your own. He's going... <laughs> So anyway, the Holy Spirit descends on the preacher. Now, if I was God, I would have never chosen our preacher to descend on. <laughs> Not to reach hippies, because this guy was a square. You know what I mean? Now, understand, there ain't nothing wrong with being square. If God has called you to be square, be square. It's all right. There's room in the kingdom for everybody, you know? And if God's called you to be square, be square. But this guy was ridiculous, you know what I'm saying? I mean, this guy was so square, he had polyester children. You know? This guy had a double-knit wife, you know what I'm saying? Lived in a split level, two cars, the whole nine yards, you know? Wore those suits with checkers and different colored pockets. I mean, the whole deal, you know? And, and had hair so short that he had one of them white rims around his head, you know, and kind of, you know. And he always talked like a preacher, always talked like a preacher, always, 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 always. I mean, the guy never shifted out of reverend, you know what I mean? I mean, see, you go to church on Sunday morning, right? You go to church on Sunday morning, and the preacher's up there and he's preaching the sermon and he's got up there and he's talking like this and he's talking about the Lord and he's bringing forth the scripture. Yes, and he's telling you about how God wants you to act and that's the way it's supposed to be done because when you go to seminary, you learn how to talk this way. You learn this in homiletics class. You learn how to preach. You learn how to do public speaking. You see, this is called oratory and there's nothing wrong with it because this is the way that you get your point across and this is something that you can do with feeling and vigor and nobody really minds. However, when everything is done, see, when everything is done and you're walking out of the church, the preacher's standing at the door, he's back down to normal, you know. Hey, good to see you this morning. Hi, little Charlie. How are you? Hey, isn't it wonderful? We're going to have a potluck Wednesday. Don't forget it, you know. And that's the way some people do, but not our preacher. Our preacher was in REV all the time. It had nothing to do with reverse either. I mean, he'd wake up in the morning and see his wife laying next to him in bed and say, Hallelujah, honey, I'm so glad to see you laying there. Why don't you hop up out of bed and run into the kitchen, fry me up a couple of eggs, fix me a couple of pieces of toast. Yeah. I mean, God. And God's got a sense of humor. God has got to have a sense of humor because God would not do the stuff that he does unless he had a sense of humor. God would have not created some of the animals that he has created unless he had a sense of humor. Look at the duck bill platypus, man. That's either a joke or a mistake, and God don't goof, you know. So God, he's up there saying, hey, I got this burden. I think I ought to lay it on somebody. There looks like somebody that would really be weird to watch this work out with. Boom, you know. And he puts it on the preacher, you know. So the preacher, you know, all of a sudden, and he's got this burning desire to reach hippies. The only problem is he wouldn't know a hippie if one kissed him in the face, you know. So he at least has enough brains to come to some of the people like us that he knows is in his church to get some help comes over, I'll never forget it as long as I live, he comes over and sits on my couch, you know, and looks at me sitting there in a the chair and he tells me this burden is on his heart. He says, 
Hallelujah, Brother One Key, those of us that have been entrusted with the welfare of our congregation in these last days before the soon coming of our Lord Jesus Christ have been laid upon by a mighty burden of the Holy Spirit to reach out into the highways and byways of this great metropolitan area and reach these no good low-down pinko faggots for Jesus. we know we have one difficulty. Yea, we have one hurdle. Yes, there is one thing that we cannot overcome and that is we wouldn't know a hippie if one tap danced across our nose. So we decided to come to some of you freaks in the church and see if you could handle it and as you are the chief freak, we decided to come to you first. <laughs> I didn't care why it gave me the opportunity. I was just glad to have it, you know. Because I really wanted to reach out into the streets and reach some of our people. and Because, uh, you know, there was some really strange goings on in those days. The way we reached them is, is we, uh, we opened this coffee house. And we played music and we gave away food. We opened this coffee house and we started having a lot of people come. We noticed right away that they were different than most people. And I had some problems uh, with relating to some of the music that we had, for example, like, you know, you can't go up to a guy on LSD and sing, I'll fly away. Because <laughs> he, he'll fly away, you know. So we went to L.A. and we hired a Jesus rock and roll band for our first concert. We had a bunch of kids come. We had about 3,000 kids come and we had to close off our street and they were all sitting in the street, kind of made a big block party out of it and had the band out front. And after the concert was over and everybody had gone home, that day about three or 400 kids given their life to the Lord. And after it was all over, <clears throat> After it was all over, I was called in to make an accounting of myself. And I remember one of the deacons looking at me and saying, Brother, <laughs> I've been going to this church for 67 years. And we never did nothing like that before. I said, you ever have 400 kids saved in one day before? He said, no. I said, well, then what's the rub, bub? I said, when the Lord laid this burden on the pastor, he didn't lay this burden on the pastor so the pastor could win friends and influence people. And when the pastor came to me and asked my help because he needed somebody to show him what a hippie was, I didn't sit around and wonder who I was going to offend and who I wasn't going to offend because, you see, I didn't do any of this stuff for you. I did it for those 400 kids that got saved. Now, if you don't want it done this way, that's fine. But don't expect God to continue to bless the burden that he's put on your heart unless you're willing to do everything that you can do in your power, whether you like it or not, whether you understand it or not, whether you agree with it or not, to get the job done. You see, the thing about it is, folks, God has not called us to be correct. He's called us to be committed. He's called us to fulfill the Great Commission, and that is to reach the world with a message of Jesus Christ. And it doesn't matter if we've never done it before. It doesn't matter if that's new. It doesn't matter if it's something strange. If it's bringing forth results, if it's producing fruits, then we need to let it do whatever job that it's supposed to do. Now understand me. I'm not saying that rock and roll music should be played in every Sunday morning church service in the world. But I'm saying that there is a place for everything that God brings forth in the kingdom of God. And we better make a place for it if we're really going to do the job that we've been called to do, you know. I'm starting to get real fed up with my brothers and sisters in the Lord. I'm starting to get real tired of Christians who have nothing for the Lord but excuses. 
I'm starting to get real tired of people who are more traditional than they are committed. And I'm getting real sick and tired of people who take and put their faith in the sign in front of the building that they go to on Sunday morning instead of the Jesus that's supposed to be in their heart. And I'm getting real sick and tired of people who are more interested in handing out their denominational statement than they are in making a statement about Jesus with their lives and with their witness. Don't get me wrong, I'm not, I'm not against the church. And if I was against the church, I wouldn't take my time to try and say some things to the church that I think that, that are needed to be said. If I wasn't a churchman myself, if I didn't believe in the local church, if I didn't believe that the church is the vehicle that God has chosen today to organize His people into an effective arm to reach the world for, for, for Himself, I would not say anything to the church. I would just let the church go down the tubes if that's what it wants to do. But I know that there are a lot of people out there in the world who need our witness, and they need it really bad. And so we haven't got time to play any of the games that we've been playing before. You see, because the Lord is coming back real soon, and He's coming for a church without spot or wrinkle. But that isn't the Baptist or the Methodist or the Presbyterian or the Catholics or the whatever. That's for all of us who have accepted Him and who are looking forward to His coming. And I don't know about you, but I figured that there's room in that category for anybody who wants to come. When I go to heaven, I want to train to be full. I don't want to go to heaven by myself. I hope heaven's crowded. I know it won't be because there's enough of heaven to go around for everybody. But you see, I wouldn't care if I was up to my armpits and brothers and sisters because I know that that would make my father happy. And whatever makes my father happy makes me happy. You know what I mean? There are four things that people need to live a successful Christian life. One is prayer. The next one is food. Anything that doesn't eat is going to die. It's true in the flesh, it's true in the mind, and it's true in the spirit. But before you start to eat, you better remember there's only two kinds of spiritual food, angels' food or devil's food, and you're going to be what you eat. The only way you can ever tell the difference between angel's food and devil's food is if you get familiar with the recipe for angel's food and it's right here in the cookbook. In other words, there's no substitute for Bible study in the life of a healthy Christian. All right? Next thing after food is faith. And faith's like a muscle. If you don't use it, it'll wither away. The, w the best way to use your faith is to witness to other people what Jesus has done in your life because the more you talk about it and the more you live it, the stronger your faith will be. And the last thing you need is you need fellowship, and fellowship is spelled C-H-U-R-C-H. -H. What kind of church should I go to, Brother Warnke? What denomination should I belong to? I don't care. Go someplace where they teach you to do the first three things. Go someplace where you're allowed to pray. Go someplace where they believe in the Word. Go someplace where they believe in exercising their faith instead of sitting around on it, and you'll be going to the right kind of church, and it doesn't matter what the words are on the sign out in front. Rose and Aaron sang a song, a song called, When I Grow Up, I Want to Be Just Like You. Well, brothers and sisters, it's about time we started growing up. It's about time we started showing some maturity. When I say maturity, I don't mean as mature Baptists or mature Methodists, or mature Pentecostals. I'm not interested in how many gifts of the Holy Spirit you got. I'm not interested in whether you know all of the books backwards and forwards about prophecy that are on the markets today. I don't care how many tapes you bought last week. I'm talking about the maturity that produces the fruits. I'm talking about people who are peaceful and kind and loving and gentle because they've come to a place in their life when they're living for Jesus instead of some idea of their own religious role. 
I'm talking about people who are producing a fruit that can be eaten by a starving world instead of a set of rules that nobody can live up to. I think it's time for us to mature. I think it's time for us to grow up. And I think it's time for people to look at us the way they look at my little girl. People look at my little girl and they say, Huh, I can look at you and I can tell whose little girl you are. You're Mike Warnke's little girl. And 